Chile marks the 50th anniversary of its coup in 1973. Hello, I'm Arnold Nido and this is The Heat. It's now 50 years since Chile was rocked by a military coup in September 1973. It was backed by the United States and brought an end to the government of the democratically elected Marxist president, Salvador Allende. General Augusto Pinochet took over and his military rule, which was bloody and divisive, lasted until 1990. Today, Chile is still dealing with the trauma of those turbulent times. We begin with this report from John Barclay in Santiago. On the 11th of September 1973, General Augusto Pinochet overthrew Socialist President Salvador Allende in a coup d'etat. His dictatorship lasted 17 years. By some estimates, more than 40,000 people became victims of kidnapping, executions, torture and other human rights abuses. The scars from those years are still evident here. Some believe that General Pinochet's economic policies made the country prosperous. Others focus on the human rights violations and brutal repression of dissent. At the end of August, the government of leftist president Gabriel Boric announced its national search plan for the remains of 1,469 victims who disappeared during Pinochet's rule. With this public policy, which is permanent, we are taking responsibility as the state. Yet the legacy of the dictatorship continues to prove divisive. Some claiming that the money the government has spent attempting to commemorate the coup d'etat and heal the wounds of the past could be better used elsewhere. It's, uh, you cannot ask for families to be in peace with the past when you have like three quarters of the cases that are not close. And so many families have no idea what happened to their beloved ones, even if they know they're dead, you know. But what happened to them where they died? President Boric has invited the leaders of all political parties to sign a joint declaration for democracy on the day of the anniversary. But right-wing parties have said they will not participate. So we're, if we're talking about reckoning with the past, it's very complicated when you don't have, don't hear a consensus, not even in basic things such as, how do you call it? I mean, uh, the, the, the right-wing, the extreme right-wing, they don't, they, they cannot call it a coup d'etat. They cannot call it a dictatorship. Recently, on the request of the Chilean government, the U.S. even declassified several documents from the day of the coup, showing exactly what President Richard Nixon knew. And half a century later, Chileans are still trying to piece together the truth about what happened under General Pinochet's regime. John Bartlett, CGTN, Santiago, Chile. We have a lot to discuss, and joining me now from Boston is Jorge Heine. He is a former Chilean ambassador to China. With us here in Washington, D.C. is Peter Kuznick. He is a history professor at American University. And also joining our discussion is Brian Becker. He is the executive director of the anti-war group, the ANSWER Coalition. Welcome to all of you. Ambassador Jorge Heine, of course, this is very much a personal story for you. And as I said, Salvador Allende was the world's first democratically elected Marxist president. But take us back to that time. What was the political environment like in Chile? Um, and how did he secure victory? The political environment in Chile in the 1960s was very much marked by the desire for change. Uh, at the time, um, President Eduardo Frey uh, was president, a Christian Democrat. He was president from 64 to 1970. He uh, undertook a number of significant policy reforms, uh, but the atmosphere was ready for more. And that is what the candidacy of Salvador Allende put uh, on the table. He was elected with 36 percent uh, of the vote, then ratified by uh, the Congress, and undertook uh, a very ambitious program, nationalizing the copper industry, land reform, nationalizing banks, sectors of industry, and in many ways trying to lift people from poverty uh, and end uh, the very significant inequality that had marked uh, Chilean society until then. It was very innovative. Why? The notion of armed revolution, of course, had been around for a long time. But the notion that you could push for socialism through peaceful means, through elections, was really something that had not been so much on the table. 
and Allende, who had been, you know, a long time senator, cabinet minister, member of the Chamber of Deputies, knew that that was the way forward. So he called for something what he called revolución con empanadas y vino tinto, with meat, revolution with meat pies and red wine, a Chilean approach to revolution, to a peaceful road to socialism, as it called it. And it was something that at the time, I was a university student at the time, that really fired up the imagination of many people, not just in Chile, not just in Latin America, but around the world. Let us keep in mind, François Mitterrand, who was later elected president of France, he visited Chile. He was interested in how this would work. In Italy, the left very much looked at Chile as a possible way forward. Right. So it was an extraordinary period and an extraordinary time. Right. Ambassador, as you say, this was a time when Chileans wanted change. Uh, what did Salvador Allende achieve in his time in office? Well, you know, it's important to understand the following. There were many problems. There was inflation. You know, people have argued that there was uh, economic mismanagement. But I will say this. Fifty years later, I would underscore uh, three things that were undertaken by the government of Salvador Allende and that have stood Chile in very good stead. The first was nationalizing the copper industry. As you may know, Chile is the uh, country with the biggest copper reserves in the world, 29% of all proven copper reserves in the world are in Chile. Until then, the, the profits from exploiting that copper went to foreign companies, to U.S. companies. Uh, the Allende government nationalized those companies and formed Codel, which is today one of the biggest copper companies in the world, the second largest producer of copper in the world in 2022. And the profits from that company go, well, to Chileans and to the Chilean state. So that has been an enormous benefit to Chile in this half century. The second is land reform. Chilean agriculture was very uh, inefficient. Chile was a net food importer, and uh, much land lie fallow owned by uh, terratenientes, you know, the land oligarchy. Mm -hmm. The land reform that was undertaken and that had been initiated before uh, Allende broke the hold of these landowners on the Chilean land. And uh, today, Chile is a very significant agricultural export. It exports something like $15 billion a year. It's, in fact, the biggest fruit export in the southern hemisphere. And the third point, I would argue, is that Chile, and under Allende, was the first country in South America to open diplomatic relations with China, with the People's Republic, initiating a very fruitful relationship, later uh, signed by the first FTA, the first free trade agreement that China signed with any individual country in 2005. Today, trade between China and Chile reaches $65 billion, which is an enormous amount, and something like 40% of Chile's exports go to China. So I would say those are very significant legacies from the Allende government. Peter Kuznick, uh, Salvador Allende came to office at the height of the Cold War. This was a time when the United States was determined to prevent the expansion of communism, of socialism. And we saw that across the globe, from Vietnam to Latin America. In fact, there was one senior United States official who said at the time uh, that Allende's victory would pave the way for a domino effect in Latin America. So how was Allende's victory seen in Washington? The United States had been involved in Chile for quite some time. The CIA involvement really began back in 1958. Then in 64, the United States helped defeat Allende when he ran for president in 1964. So in 1970, when Allende was running again, U.S. policy was strongly committed to preventing him from winning. When he won, nevertheless, the U.S. adopted a two-track policy. Track one was massive propaganda campaign, as well as bribing uh, electors not to seat him. When that didn't work, and he was seated overwhelmingly in 1970, then the U.S. adopted the track two policy, which was a military coup. The United States was very open about this. Nixon and Kissinger ordered it, 
they had they went through CIA director Helms, who worked with uh, David Phillips Attlee, who was the CIA station chief in Brazil, and they worked with the factions of the military. The military had long been apolitical and supported the democracy. You have to remember that Chile had been a democracy since 1932, but it was a democracy that was not going to survive Nixon and Kissinger. And so they, they started working with the coup planners. The U.S. provided arms, U.S. provided uh, intelligence, U.S. provided financial aid, and they worked, first of all, to destroy the economy there with certain Chileans like Agustin Edwards, uh, who owned El Mercurio, the biggest newspaper in Chile, as well as copper interests and Pepsi bottling interests. Uh, and they, he worked with them to, in order to create an atmosphere of chaos in the country economically. And then when that wasn't enough, then they had the military coup. And so the U.S. was up to its eyeballs in this. But it was part of what was going on, as you suggested, across the world. The U.S. policy in Latin America was dominated by the Mann Doctrine. Mm -hmm. And the Mann Doctrine said that Latin American governments would be judged not on how they serve the interests of their people, but how they serve the interests of the $9 billion in U.S. investments. And so when the Chileans decided to nationalize under uh, Allende to nationalize Kennecott Copper and Anaconda and ITT, uh, the U.S. was not happy, and they did not want to allow Chile to become an example for our model for the rest of Latin America or other countries throughout the underdeveloped world. And so the United States came down with an iron fist, and they said it must be a military coup, because that's going to send the message to anybody else who wants to follow in Allende's footsteps. Brian, great to see you. Brian. Uh, Allende uh, actually addressed the United Nations uh, General Assembly. That was in December of 1972, about one year before he was overthrown. Uh, you know, Peter mentioned ITT, that's the giant U.S. corporation. He accused ITT of planning with the United States government to overthrow him. Let's listen to part of what he had to say in that address to the U.N. Se proponía... Its objectives included strangling the economy, diplomatic sabotage, fomenting social disorder, and sowing panic among the population so that the government, it was hoped, would lose control of the situation and the armed forces would be impelled to break the democratic system and impose a dictatorship. So, Brian, we do know from declassified documents now that the United States, the United States rather, played a major role in Allende's overthrow. There were secret meetings between United States intelligence agents uh, with Chilean military officials. Uh, what was the broader role of the United States in the overthrow of Allende, and was it actually just a matter of time before he was ousted? Right. That the, the United States, from the beginning, was, as, as Peter said, in, in, engaged in how to destroy the Allende government. First, when he didn't win the election uh, in the 1960s, and then they tried to do a decertification campaign of the election in 1970, and then immediately when that failed, they began coup planning. And, you know, frankly, everybody knew it. I mean, everybody knew it. I was uh, actually today, 50 years ago, in the streets in New York City, where I am today, with 10,000 people protesting against the U.S. sponsored coup d'etat. Uh, 10,000 people in New York City and people all over the Latin America, all over the United States, knew that the Nixon administration had used every available tool to destroy a government that came to power through democratic elections. Uh, they used the economic destabilization, as the Nixon administration said, we want to make the economy scream, meaning make so much suffering and misery for Chileans that they would be open to a coup. The U.S. used the same method, by the way, uh, 20 years earlier when they overthrew the Iranian government, Mossack Day also elected who dared to nationalize the Anglo-Iranian oil company, what we now call BP. The U.S. did it to the Arbenz government when it nationalized United Fruit in 1954. It invaded Dominican Republic in 1965. You know, there was this history that everybody actually knew about. 
And as Allende said so eloquently from the from the podium in December 1972, he documented what the actual what the United States was actually doing. So it was like a coup, but it was a coup that was out in the open. And then the U.S. government just assumed that the U.S. corporate owned media would go along and, and sanction anything as long as it was as long as it was against the socialist government, even if that government came to power through a democratic election. You know, the ambassador mentioned that, that Allende won a plurality, 36 percent of the vote. But, but among working class and young Chileans, it was a vast majority of people who were voting for Allende. And the U.S. didn't want people in Latin America or anywhere to get the idea that they could use any means, not just armed struggle in the case of Cuba, but any means, including democratic elections in the case of Chile, to, to carry out change that would be you know, beneficial to those countries, but detrimental to U.S. multinational corporations. Ambassador Heine, as you pointed out, you were a young man, a university student at that time when the coup took place, September 11, 1973. Military jets had bombed the presidential uh, palace in uh, Santiago. Uh, in fact, in his final words, Allende said, other men will overcome this dark and bitter moment when treason seeks to prevail. He went on to say that these would be my last words. What do you remember of the time? Well... I will say this, you know, it's in, in some ways it's quite uh, remarkable that today we are talking about a military coup in Latin America. There have been so many coups in Latin America, you know, that, uh, that we single this out in particular tells you something. Why is that so significant? Two reasons, I would say. One is that Chile had a very long democratic tradition, uh, even before uh, 1932, as it was mentioned. Uh, throughout its, uh, until then, 150 years of independent history, uh, Chile stood out, not just in Latin America, but throughout the world, as one of the most stable and institutionalized uh, democracies. Therefore, to have that democratic breakdown was considered, you know, particularly significant and particularly noteworthy. And the other point was the sheer violence of the coup. I mean, let us realize the Chilean Air Force has never participated in a shooting war. And on that day, the Hawker Hunter fighter jets shot at the presidential palace. You know, so it's, it's something that had never been seen before. And the other thing that I would underline is the commitment of Allende himself. Uh, some people thought that, you know, he would have taken the easy route and, you know, quit and take a plane and leave uh, the country. But that was not his style. He had said on many occasions that he would only leave uh, La Moneda, the presidential palace, in a wooden pajama, uh, meaning that he would not leave La Moneda alive. And that is exactly what happened. So it was an extraordinary moment. And I would like to underscore that in the past 50 years, that the figure of Allende has grown and grown. His commitment to building a more just society, a fairer Chile, through peaceful means, which is what he stood for, right. uh, has really stood the test of time. And Ambassador uh, General Augusto Pinochet, who uh, seized power at that time, he ruled the country for 17 years. And during those 17 years, thousands of people were imprisoned, were tortured, thousands more uh, had been disappeared. Uh, in fact, even on one occasion when bodies were found, I think it was at a lime quarry, uh, Pinochet ordered his military to get rid of all other bodies. And they were dropped into the ocean. They were dropped down volcanoes. Some of them were blown up. Um, what do you remember of that? Well, I will underscore uh, the following. You know, the defenders of Pinochet will often say that uh, he did all this for the sake of a greater good and that somehow uh, you know, the Chilean economy uh, picked up in the last years of the dictatorship. Well, you know, uh, to undertake the sort of things that you mentioned takes a very special mentality, it takes a very special uh, outlook, and there is no way that can be justified. Now, what I find particularly sad and particularly tragic is that uh, 50 years later uh, in Chile, we still cannot agree on a, a way forward mm. that unites us all. As has been mentioned, the Chilean government, the government of President Boric, tried to get a joint statement 
from all political parties, government and opposition, on this very special day. And he did not succeed in that. Why? Because there are still very recalcitrant sectors in the opposition, in uh, the Chilean right wing, that support General Pinochet and that uh, defend uh, what he did, amazing uh, as it may seem. Peter, you know, as we just heard, Chile was just one of many Latin American countries where the United States intervened. It overthrew governments. It removed leaders. There were targeted killings. It fomented conflict in certain places. How pervasive was this at that time? Well, when Oliver Stone and I did our Vietnam episode, we placed Vietnam in context. And we talked about, first, the CIA overthrow of the Goulart government in Brazil in 1964. Then there's U.S. sending 23,000 troops into the Dominican Republic in 1965. The U.S. support for the Indonesian coup in 1965, in which between a half million and a million people were massacred. Uh, the U.S. support for the right-wing governments in Greece. And then in Vietnam, you know, that was the the major U.S. involvement at the time, more than a half a million troops there. When Robert McNamara came into my class, he said that he accepts that 3.8 million Vietnamese died in that war. So what happened in Chile was horrific, and the U.S. fingerprint was all over it, but the U.S. was doing this around the world during those years. You know, so that's why when the U.S. talks about rules-based international order, people in the Global South, scratch your heads and say, what rules are you talking about? Look at the U.S. history but later in, uh, in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya. You know, so um, there's a certain hypocrisy because the U.S. tries to project itself as the voice of freedom and democracy. When the reality is the U.S. behavior has sadly been very, very different. Today, if you turn on the television, it's all about the United States getting hit on 9-11. Do you hear any discussion about what happened in Chile? When the United States is the victim, they're happy to parade that. When the United States is the aggressor, the victimizer, that is not really something that the U.S. wants to uh, announce or promote. Brian, for many years, the legal efforts to bring those accountable for what happened in Chile was paralyzed by uh, a law, and this was a Pinochet-era law, which gave amnesty to people who were involved in this. But recently, we've seen more vigorous efforts, uh, uh, specifically by the uh, government now, the, president, the government of President uh, Gabriel uh, Boric. Uh, but, you know, will there be accountability at some stage? We know that at one time Pinochet went to London. He was arrested there uh, on the basis of a warrant that was issued by Spain, but he was later released. He went back to Chile, where he died. Uh, will there be accountability? Uh, sadly, no. This is one of the tasks for history, though. And I think that Allende's legacy, uh, which is to fight for uh, working people, to fight for the poor, to fight for peasants, to fight to improve society so that the wealth, uh, instead of being aggregated at the very top for a very few, can be shared for, by, by the many. These aspirations of Allende go on and on. We see them all over the world, including uh, the uprisings that are taking place in different forms throughout the global south. And so, in a sense, accountability will have to be taken in hand by history when Allende's legacy can be actually implemented, not only for the people of Chile, not only for Latin America, but for poor people everywhere. Ambassador, what do we know about the thousands of people who were uh, disappeared? Do we know how many were disappeared? where they are. I mean, what are the ongoing efforts uh, right now to find out what happened to them, uh, their fate? And was there a role also played at the time by the military dictatorship in Brazil? First of all, let me um, underscore the following. Uh, there has been some accountability. There are, you know, a large number of uh, officers from the various armed forces that are serving time in jail in Chile right now because of their involvement in uh, what happened in the human rights violations that took place in those 17 years. Now, th this didn't happen to, to Pinochet, but there are a large number of officers that are serving time. So it's important to underscore that. Now, the second point on the issue of the disappeared. 
there's a great uh, paradox here, which is the following. Uh, at first, uh, you know, people that were arrested and, and shot, um, well, they were buried. Uh, and then uh, Pinochet decided that it was better to have them made disappear, uh, because that would make an even bigger impact on uh, the relatives and friends. You know, if somebody is killed and there's proof of the body, it's one thing. But if somebody disappears, there's always the expectation that he or she would come back, which in some ways makes the suffering even worse. But the irony is that that was the case. Then one judge said, uh, Juan Guzman, said, well, if the people have been disappeared, it means it is not a murder, it is a kidnapping, which is an ongoing crime. And therefore, it is not covered by the amnesty law that Pinochet himself had passed. And that opened the door for many of these uh, trials uh, to go on and for many of these uh, officers to be brought to justice. So in, in some ways, it is something that ended up being a, a boomerang for, for Pinochet. Now, this doesn't mean that the search for the bodies and the remains of these victims doesn't have to go on. It goes on, and uh, the government of President Boric is making a very systematic effort to find them. Ambassador, one final point. At a ceremony on Wednesday in Chile, uh, President Gabriel Boric said, justice has taken too long. Um, how is the country dealing with this, the past right now on this 50th anniversary? Yes. You know, there are sort of uh, two ways of looking at this. One way, and some people say uh, we shouldn't, you know, wallow in the past. We must look ahead. We must build uh, a better future for all of us. And then there's another view that says, well, uh, those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it. I very much uh, think that it is the second view that is the right one. Uh, you know, you cannot forget these things. Uh, it's, it, it's like a wound. If you let a wound on the body fester, it will end up killing you. Uh, and the same happens with societies. If societies do not come to terms with their evil past, as uh, is the case in, in Chile uh, right. today, well, they will be in serious trouble. Okay, and that is where we have to leave it. Thank you to all of you for being with us. And that's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C.